Hello, everybody. My name is Sarah Backley, and I'm Associate Director at the British Chamber of Commerce here in Japan. Thank you all so much for joining during your lunchtime. This will be a one hour session, so perfect for that one hour off that I'm sure you'll have.、Um, thanks for joining us today to our session, which is entitled From the Editor's Desk The Nikkei Asia Story.、Um, I'd like to pass straight on to our moderator today, Graham Davis. He's Senior Advisor at the BCCJ to give、um, a bit of background and context into、um, today's session and also to introduce our two wonderful speakers. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Sarah, and hello, everybody.、Uh, Graham Davis here from the、uh, BCCJ.、Uh, just before we go into today's event, if I could just spend a moment just to talk about some upcoming events that we've,、uh, we've got.、Um, the 27th of April is our next event, and that's actually a very important one the annual general meeting.、Um, sadly, again, online, but the content、uh, will be the same the annual report, the financials, and the introduction uh, from the, uh, of the new executive、uh, committee. Um, a great chance for you to get involved, great chance you, for you to hear from the executive committee and the president about the year that's gone and the plans for the year ahead, and to, for you to get involved in what is very much your、uh, chamber. So, do please join us on the 27th of April.、Um, after that, the other event that I wanted to draw your attention to is on May the 12th, where we're going to be talking about the internationalization of Japanese universities. Um, we have put together a stellar panel for you. We've got case studies from Okinawa and Tohoku,、uh, both of whom are coming at the internationalization issue from very different、uh, angles,、uh, but both with very compelling stories.、Uh, we've got、uh, input from the UK, we've got input from、uh, sector experts,、uh, and we've also got the lead policymaker from the Ministry of uh, Education, uh, MEX,、uh, in Japan. So we're in for a very、uh, informative. Uh, I think、uh, 90 minutes、uh, on that day. We are also、uh, transforming our regular coffee sessions, which we've been running every other Thursday. And we're going to be introducing themes to these from now on. So look out for those.、Uh, the, the first theme will be on the issue of transitioning for, in life、um, and uh, work. Uh, so perhaps approaching retirement, changing jobs. Issues like that,、um, what you need to think about, how to prepare, et cetera. And we'd like to draw people together and get in and come and join us for a chat around these themes. So look out for notification of that. Okay, enough of what's coming up. Let's get on with the meat of today's event、uh, and hear from our two great speakers Chris Grimes, the executive editor of the Nikkei Asia, and a staff writer, Francesca Regalado,、um, who's been with the Nikkei Asia since 2019. And what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about how the Nikkei Asia has transformed itself over the last few years、uh, from a print based uh, uh, publication to very much a digital led、um, uh, issue.、Um, and something which I think from the content side has moved very much from articles which were translated from、uh, the Nikkei in Japanese to completely its own content. And I think it's important that people realize just how. Wide and ambitious, the content is of the Nikkei Asia. And if you were to just click on the、uh, homepage, as I did about an hour ago, you would find articles today on the terrorism issue in Pakistan, China US relations,、uh, the Myanmar coup. I have to draw attention to that because I think the、um, Nikkei Asia's coverage of the Myanmar coup has been absolutely best in、uh, class. Um, there's another、uh, thought leadership piece on air pollution、uh, across Asia. Uh, and then, when you drill down into the various industries that the Nikkei Asia cover, there's a great article on Taiwan's semiconductor industry. So, it's just as vast as Asia is in terms of geography, as huge as Asia is in terms of、um, population, there is also a vast amount of content available、uh, in the Nikkei uh, Asia. Um, and that is hugely、uh, impressive. I'm going to ask. Chris Grimes, the executive editor,、um, to kick things off and, and tell us a little bit about the Nikkei Asia, its history, its mission, and talk a little bit about the、um, relationship with the Financial Times, who, of course, were acquired by this wonderful British、uh, newspaper,、uh, a global leader in business、uh, coverage, acquired by the Nikkei in uh, 2015. Um, something of a shock at the time. But, Chris, over to you and tell us a bit about the、um, Nikkei Asia and, and your job. Terrific. Well, thanks really. Thanks very much, Graham, for that really nice introduction. And thanks also, especially for pointing out our Myanmar coverage, which we're very proud of. And、uh, we feel like we've uh, uh, 
uh, put a lot, uh, really a lot of effort into uh, to making that that uh, that story live for our readers. So just to give you a little bit of potted history on on where we came from, uh, the roots of Nikkei Asia are uh, in the Nikkei Weekly, which was uh, a weekly translated uh, uh, product of, uh, of business stories, mostly into English. It had a very loyal following. In fact, I, I first heard of it back in the 90s when I was a tech reporter back in the States. And a lot of the investors and hedge fund guys that I talked to, they lived for this to find out what was happening with memory chips in Japan and disk drives and stuff like that. Um, in 2011, they started an iPad edition uh, as Nikkei Asian Review. And then a couple of years later, did a splashy introduction of a of the print magazine, which uh, you can still see on the stands every week today, along with the website. And that began to introduce some of some original reporting for the publication that wasn't being translated from Nikkei. And I think the goal of this was to fill a void that had been left years earlier by the Far East Economic Review and Asia Week, which were, you know, Western-based, Western-owned publications, but still covered all of Asia. And the idea was to give the world an independent English language uh, uh, publication that was produced in Asia by Asians. Um, uh, so in 2015, Nikkei acquired the Financial Times. We were also surprised in the FT newsroom at the time. Um, and one of the things that I think that they wanted to do at Nikkei was for the FT to transfer some of its experience building a digital first subscription business, which is something that we've been working on at the FT for over 20 years. So soon after the FT acquisition, I mean, almost immediately after the deal closed, uh, I was still at the FT newsroom in London at the time. And we started seeing having frequent visitors from uh, Tokyo who sat in on our, our meetings and watched what we were doing. And then it, the traffic started flowing the other way. Um, FT people would come to Tokyo and spend often just a couple of weeks or maybe a month uh, at uh, mostly at Nikkei Asian Review. And the idea I think evolved pretty quickly that uh, the Nikkei Asian Review could become a laboratory for this bigger Nikkei transition into digital publishing. Um, just to, to back up a little bit, the FT a couple of years earlier had made this really wrenching, pretty radical shift in the way it approached its business. Um, we had always had a pretty good website, but uh, but the newspaper still, the, the production schedule of the newspaper still dictated everything that we did. And around 2015, we started to flip this upside down. News, the newspaper came last and publishing stories online became first. Uh, we had been, we realized we'd been publishing stories according to the newspaper schedule, which meant that stories went online around 10 o'clock, which is exactly when our readers were not there. So we flipped it upside down to start publishing when our readers were actually online. Um, so this was, the, uh, this was the thing starting in about 2017, the year that I came and a couple of other FT people came to try to do help midwife this digital transition. And to be honest, I think my colleagues would, uh, my Nikkei colleagues would agree it was as painful here as it was there. Um, it's just because it's not fun. You have to change your, uh, it changes the whole journalist lifestyle. You, um, you have to come in and start thinking immediately as opposed to, uh, you know, slipping into action around five o'clock in the evening for deadline time. We also introduced some long form deep dive journalism, which is what brought me here. I had been the uh, big read editor at FT before. And we also began hiring uh, more local reporters in places like Taipei, more recently Ho Chi Minh City, Hong Kong, Silicon Valley even. Um, so uh, we can go into more depth about this later, but so far we really like what we see. Um, our daily readership on average is uh, more than five times what it was three years ago. Paid subscriptions are growing significantly, uh, which is, 
uh, not easy. Getting people to pay for content when there's a lot of free content is not easy. And we've won in the last two years, seven SOPA awards and four Asian media awards uh, just in the last two years. Um, and I guess I should also note that the Japanese edition of Nikkei has also gone completely digital first, has a strong paid subscription model in addition to what's still a really robust uh, uh, print newspaper business. So I think I can leave it there. Okay, thanks for that. We'll come back to that. One thing I really liked there was your uh, idea of business change actually being a lifestyle change. I, that, <laughs> that is so true across a lot of areas. Um, just before I bring in uh, Francesca, um, I should have told everybody, please raise questions via the Q&A function. Um, uh, we're going to have about 10 or 15 minutes chat between myself and Chris and, and Francesca, and then I want uh, uh, as many questions as possible coming in. So please use the Q&A function for that. Um, Francesca, let, let me bring you in. As staff writer uh, since 2019, um, Chris talked about this being an English language publication for Asia. I mean, when you sit down and start writing an article, who do you think you're writing for? What's your image of the reader? And where are they? Who are they? What kind of functions? How, how do you picture that? Uh, well, I have the benefit of uh, knowing some of our readers. I grew up in the Philippines. And uh, when I think of who I'm writing for, I think about my friends and my relatives who are reading Nikkei Asia in the Philippines and what topics might be of interest to them, what topics might be relevant to them that they haven't thought about yet, and how to write about those subjects in uh, an engaging manner. Um, there is a tendency sometimes where we uh, become a little too hyper local and focus too much on Japan in um, some stories or the way we write them. I'm prone to that when I write about the Olympics, for example. Um, it seems like a very Japan story, uh, but it's also uh, it's also a business story. It's also an international relations story, um, and so we really have to think out of the box when we cover that topic. Uh, our readership, as far as our marketing team tells us, uh, is really growing in Southeast Asia. It holds the greatest promise for us in terms of potential uh, readers. And so I think when I'm sitting down to write a story, I think of the reader in Southeast Asia, mostly. Um, so Southeast Asia, where, where do you mean, which, which countries, territories are, are you thinking of there? Um, thinking in particular in the Philippines uh, and Thailand. Uh, we, I'm not really sure about Vietnam. Maybe Chris can tell us a little more about that because we just uh, hired a new correspondent there. Um, but definitely in the Philippines, uh, we uh, are really focusing on uh, the readership in that country. Okay, good. Chris, do you have any, anything to add in terms of your, I mean, you've got journalists everywhere. Yes. Have you got readers everywhere? We do. We, uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot of readers. Uh, we have a growing number of readers in the United States, um, uh, Singapore, uh, Philippines, Malaysia, um, in Hong Kong. So, uh, and, you know, it's been interesting, even with all the problems that they're having in Myanmar uh, with, um, with internet service and so forth, we've been, getting, we've been getting more readers from Myanmar, which is really gratifying. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, it's, uh, uh, it's really diverse geographically. I think I have a few readers in, that I keep in mind. Um, I, like Francesca, I'm, I'm thinking about, we've started uh, amping up our coverage of uh, startups in Southeast Asia and tech in Southeast Asia. Um, so I, I'm trying to think about what uh, a venture capitalist who's based in uh, Jakarta or Singapore might want to read. Um, uh, our coverage of the US-China trade war really started to get us a lot of attention from Washington, I think. Uh, and now this, uh, the creation of the Quad is also bringing us a lot of uh, attention in, in Washington. Um, and uh, and 
uh, our coverage of the tech supply chain, which we really specialize in. That's a business issue that brings in a lot of business readers, but it's also become a geopolitical issue. So I think uh, uh, we're, we are writing for a DC audience as well as a, a business audience in, in, uh, when we cover tech now. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, the one thing that's great is you're not short of stories or things to write about. There's right. One or two things going on in the world. Can we go back to the business model and talk about, I mean, five or six years ago, it wasn't clear that publications at any end of the market could survive on the subscription-based uh, model. Is that now, are you more confident about that, that the subscription model is going to be sustainable, growable, uh, and are you also thinking about where you fit in against the tech giants, the um, you know, and the uh, you know Googles of, of, of this world? So tell us about that. Sure. Well, we have. Uh, I'm old enough and have been in the business long enough to remember when uh, the answer was free uh, and that we shouldn't be charging for our content online to the to subscriptions um and that's that's where we still are now and one of the reasons i think we can feel a little bit more confident about that is uh how comfortable people are now uh with paying for subscriptions for a spotify account or for a netflix uh, account or for an apple music account um streaming video streaming music I think it's taken a long time for this behavior to change, but it is changing. Um, now, uh, just going back to the geography question again, uh, many of the um, many of the countries that we're writing about uh, are still, you know, developing places, and so it is kind of a big ask, I think, uh, for them to to shuck out uh, for a subscription when there's so much free information. <laughs> however, however, uh, I think something that's kind of baked into uh, our image of ourselves is that we are a trusted media source and in some of those same places there isn't one uh, necessarily. So, um, so I think that that does help. In terms of the business model, the sort of Spotify streaming services, they, they kind of set a price point that for people like yourselves, don't they? I mean, that kind of dictates the level of you can charge, do you feel? Um, so oh, the, 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 what Spotify charges also sets an expectation for what we charge? For Yeah, for what people are prepared to pay, you know. Yes, I think so. Uh, some, some news uh, subscriptions are, are really expensive. You know, the New York Times is expensive and the FT is expensive and the journal is expensive. We are less expensive. Um, and so I think it does resemble more like a Spotify, uh, uh, price than, uh, than yeah, a New York times price. So I think it is geared to, uh, where we are in the world and, and also what, what we're producing. Okay. Um, I want to move on and talk about, um, challenges you've had in developing a, a voice, developing an editorial, uh, culture because, a Nikkei article and an FT article are, I think, very different things. Um, and maybe you could sort of give a synopsis of how they differ. But more importantly, how are you developing this? When I when you read a Nikkei, uh, the Nikkei Asia now, it, it seems to have a more consistent voice than it did before. Talk about that journey and you know, your ambitions there. Right. So you're absolutely right. I, I think uh, there's... The, the way a, a Nikkei news story is structured is different from the way an FT news story is structured. And it's not that one way is right or wrong, they're just different. Mm -hmm. And so we are, uh, since we are trying to reach an English reading uh, audience, we, uh, we are going in sort of the Anglo-American style. Um, we have done a number of workshops and master classes, often with FT, journalists to talk about news writing and feature writing. Um, and so this is something that we're, that we're working on and it's an active, um, this is an active thing. Uh, and um, so there's that, but I think it, 
this idea of a voice is really interesting. Um, and it goes back to kind of this idea of an Asian perspective. So hiring the people who we hire, uh, obviously we have a core of, of Japanese uh, reporters um, who are writing in English, but we also have people from Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Vietnamese Americans, uh, Hong Kong, Kong Chinese, mainland Chinese, Korea. Uh, we have a lot of women uh, writing here. So I think, um, I think in a way that, um, uh, at least in terms of perspective, uh, I think that uh, that is a unique perspective, right? And it's it's a different um, it's different than you would get from uh, foreign correspondents who are here uh, writing for their home markets. Well, let's hear from Francesca, who's at the cold face and is actually a a writer. Francesca, what do you feel about this uh, idea of the, you know, what you're trying to do in terms of bringing in two different cultures or, or more different cultures, in fact? Oh, well, uh, I'm, when I came here uh, in 2019, uh, I was the only uh, non-Japanese reporter on the Nikkei Asia staff. Uh, so there was a lot of getting used to uh, between me and the other reporters. Um, and the first couple of times that we tried writing stories together, that was a little rough going because uh, I wanted to defer to them as the local thematic experts. Um, but then I also had my own ideas of how stories should be written um, coming from an American journalism background. Um, and I think uh, now that I've been here for nearly two years, um, they've gotten used to um, this, the way that I think, uh, think of writing and how I conceptualize stories. Um, and we've learned from each other in that way. Uh, the, what I've learned from them the most is, uh, well, I, I like to eavesdrop on their phone calls. Um, they know, of course. Um, and I listen to how they phrase their questions in Japanese. Um, my Japanese is still poor, um, but I try to do some phone calls uh, in Japanese. And it's, uh, it's, it's a totally different tone to how I was taught to do interviews and ask questions uh, in the US. Um, and so that's how I've learned from them. Um, on the other hand, when I've done joint interviews with them, uh, they say, oh, you, you ask questions like so aggressively and so directly. And I said, well, you know, if you have only 30 minutes with a person, you can't really uh, dilly dally. Uh, and so that's where I think uh, the cultures um, have had to blend um, with the editors. Uh, our editors are incredibly balanced, I think because half of our editors are Japanese and the other half are Americans or British or Australians. Um, and so we really get a mix of uh, voices and backgrounds editing our work and making sure that anything we publish is, uh, has a stable, fair, consistent voice. There's a question coming from uh, Kubo San Economist Corporate Network, which um, perhaps I could put to you, Chris, which is about an editorial board and disputes between, you know, uh, the FT view of the world and the Nikkei view of the world. How, how do you, at the editorial level and po or sort of policy uh, opinion level, balance the two? Uh, that's an interesting question. There was, uh, I think, uh, a, f a few years ago when we were, the FT was first starting to get involved in this, there was a big discussion about, about opinion uh, and also about um, to what extent we wanted to let readers interact with us with comments um, uh, and even uh, old fashioned letters. Um, so we, uh, we have a, uh, we have our own opinion section. We have our own opinion editor at Nikkei Asia, and uh, that person is free to commission um, 
uh, from a wide range of, of, of people. We are, we're trying to get more Asian voices uh, uh, all the time. This is something that we're always working on. Um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 so, and, and kind of move away from just getting Washington think tankers writing about Asia. This is something that we want to kind of move away from it uh, or make less, less common. Um, I think every now and then we do uh, publish something that uh, uh, maybe differs from uh, the Nikkei editorial line. I think we were out front on uh, things like coal. Um, uh, and uh, although I, I think that's starting to change with the Nikkei position. Um, and uh, I think we probably write more about women's issues on our uh, opinion page. Uh, so, so there is a difference, and I, I think it's pre we're pretty independent. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't think we've had any. We've had many issues where they've said, "No, you're crossing a line." Okay, um, I, I might come back to that because, um, well, in fact, I will because there's a question coming in at the objectives behind the opinion column, what you're trying to um, develop or how it's developed uh, and how it differs from the Nikkei or the uh, FT. Um, so our questioner is saying he's seen some, or they have seen some high profile pe pieces by people like uh, Guterres and Malcolm Turnbull, et cetera. So well, what's the vision there? Well, uh, I think uh, in the cases of, uh, the case of Turnbull, he was, uh, uh, involved in some really interesting stuff recently and wanted to write for us. Um, and actually, uh, I believe I have to, uh, I know certainly in the case of Kevin Rudd, um, uh, he came to our opinion section through a rel relationship with Japanese Nikkei. So they had already, they already had uh, him writing. Uh, they had a, a relationship with him already. So that came he came through that side, um, and uh, and I, I, frankly, I, maybe it's just blowing our own horn here. But I think we're becoming more high profile, and people realize that if they want to reach this audience, this is a really good way to do it. Okay. And, um, Francesca, just coming back to the thing that you were just talking about of the. Um, balance of people in the newsroom and the learning experience. What do you think you've had to change by coming into a, you know, I'm trying to picture a Nikkei type newsroom. And what do you think they have had to change? How, how's that developed? Oh, uh, personally, I have uh, made many faux pas uh, getting used to Japanese business culture. Um, for example, when I was in DC, when I was working as a reporter in DC, it was totally normal to just walk into Capitol Hill and go up to a senator's office and wait for them to come in or out uh, and lob questions at them. Um, I tried that once at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and it did not go over well. Um, I was told you need to make an appointment or you need to call in advance. Uh, and so I learned my lesson there. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, I, I think um, I've had to uh, temper my expectations, uh, but what I really appreciate about uh, journalism and I guess like public relations in Japan is if I send a question to a company or a government ministry, I can trust that they are making an earnest effort to get me an honest answer. Uh, I will always hear back from them. And maybe that's because I start my emails with, hi, I'm a reporter with Nikkei. Uh, and that carries a lot of weight. But uh, you, can't, you can't always trust that that's going to happen in the US. Uh, and so that's what I love about doing journalism here and uh, what I'm going to miss when I eventually uh, move on to another bureau. Um, and in terms of what Nikkei has had to do to adjust to me, 
um, since I was their first experiment, I guess, uh, the first um, journalist straight out of grad school uh, who's a foreigner that they hired in Tokyo. Um, there's been a lot of HR changes that have had to happen to get me into the company. Um, for example, our expense system is still entirely in Japanese. Uh, and that's going to finally have an English version in the summer. Um, but that was something they didn't consider before I came in. Um, and then in terms of, uh, you know, the, the reporters in Japan, when they join a company, uh, it's like the typical seishaiin system where you join straight out from college and you have this job for the rest of your life until you retire and you cover this one sector um, and build sources and that's what you do for your whole career. Um, I did not have that luxury coming into Tokyo. And so one of the most helpful things that uh, an FT editor said to me on my first day was um, run until someone tells you to stop. And so I've just been dipping my fingers into different topics and enjoying being a generalist until I found uh, an assignment uh, that I was really comfortable in and that was covering foreign affairs. Um, but up until that point, and I guess even until now, the other reporters have had to adjust to me sort of tiptoeing into their beats and, you know, and we have to put our heads together to figure out, oh, like, how can I use your expertise and my fresh take on this to write a story that's, um, like, fresh and interesting to our readers. Have they given you, like, a mentor or somebody, or have you had to figure all this out yourself? Uh, how's that worked? Uh, Chris is my mentor. <laughs> right. yeah. um, the, the editors, uh, because we're very, uh, it's, Nikkei Asia is like a startup, inside the Nikkei C. Uh, and so we're, I think we're, it, we're all just figuring things out as we go along and that's really fun. Um, and so I can be really comfortable with my editors and you know approach them when I have problems or when I need advice. Uh, and same thing with my fellow reporters. We, uh, we're, we collaborate a lot and ask each other for advice. Um, and so I don't think that I really had to be assigned a mentor because everyone was incredibly helpful. Okay, that's uh, interesting to hear. Um, let's talk about COVID. Uh, it's a thing that's in the background. How has that changed? What challenges have, has that had for the Nikkei Asia specifically? How have you coped? Um, and what do you think the legacy um, is going to be? Maybe Francesca, you could continue and just talk about how it's changed your daily life. Oh, um, well, I don't go into the office anymore. Uh, recently, since there's been a spike in cases, uh, reporters are encouraged to uh, work from home or work from outside. Um, of course, I still take you know lunch or coffee interviews uh, face to face, uh, trying to lessen that now. Um, I, this is probably bad for a reporter, but I used to be terrified of phone calls. Um, I used to hate picking up the phone, um, but because of COVID and everyone stuck at home, I had no other choice but to do it. And like now I have no problem with it. Um, fortunately, because of COVID, all my sources and contacts are also stuck at home um, and have more time than they would have otherwise to pick up my calls and talk to me. Um, and so it's actually helped me a little bit with uh, sourcing and getting information. Um, and whenever I do go into the office, uh, it's just to check in with editors. Um, so I probably go like once a week at most. Um, there was an entire month long stretch that I went to the office twice. Uh, and that's been, that hasn't been a problem at all. Uh, I'm still in close contact with all of my editors. Okay, Chris, as an institution, the challenge and what you've done. So we were pretty nervous about this, I think, at the beginning, because, um, well, there, there were questions about whether um, uh, our 
Japanese colleagues who's who you know spend a lot of time in the office and also with each other outside the office uh, would adapt and whether this was going to work. But um, many of our colleagues actually really, really uh, uh, enjoyed it and th have thrived uh, in this setting. So we, we pretty quickly uh, moved a lot of uh, things that usually took place in informal verbal chats on a desk they went on to Slack. And so there are all these various Slack channels. It works pretty well. Um, the, uh, and, and when you think about it, it was just a remarkable news year last year. It was incredible. Uh, and uh, we, did, uh, we, we did some things that we had never done before. We set up a live 24 hour COVID blog that was free to read. Uh, it, it was incredibly popular with our readers. Our traffic uh, doubled or more um, as a result of this. Um, and this was managed, you know, from somebody's, you know, somebody's bedroom someplace else. And, you know, it was, uh, it just worked. It was, it was kind of amazing. So that that's on that side. Uh, we, of course, we miss the casual bumping into Francesca at the at the uh, water cooler or the elevator and getting that kind of quick little story idea. Um, that that's that's missing. Some of the reporters say that. Uh, they, they're having difficulty making new sources and that their old sources are tired um, or that they're worried about wearing out their old sources. Um, so, so those are some problems. And I think the biggest problem operationally, which I think maybe many of your members may be finding just is, it has to do with getting uh, people in and out of the country. Uh, we've had uh, people prepared to leave an assignment in one country and go become a reporter in China and they can't. Uh, we are worried that some of the FT people who are supposed to come later this year won't be able to. So this is a real, this is a real uh, organizational headache. Any solutions to that or nothing you can do really? Look, if anybody has any ideas, uh, I'm willing to hear them. <laughs> well, here, here's, here's one suggestion. This comes from Tony Grundy, who used to be on the executive committee as a, a lawyer. Um, I'm going to quote this uh, directly because um, you'll, you'll see why in a minute. Would it be helpful to merge the FT Tokyo Bureau into Nikkei Asia? I believe, Tony says, FT rotates journalists generally in the same way as diplomats, which improves perspectives. Would the foreign journalist benefit from the fact-checking depth of the Nikkei? He recalls the comments of an FT bureau head who was in Tokyo more than 20 years ago, who told him that she felt she was doing well if 60% of what she wrote was accurate. Perhaps that was a joke, says Tony, but um, the idea of merging the two bureaus. And uh, well, uh, so one of the things that um, was an issue when uh, Nikkei uh, made its offer for the FT was a uh, was a separation in the the units, and this was this was taken very seriously that uh, that the FT would maintain editorial independence. So I think um, just the idea of, of sharing office space is a little, you know, uh, I think I think we are starting to do that in in some places, and I think in Singapore, for instance, we're doing that. And I believe we're opening a joint office in Houston, Texas together. Um, but uh, the, uh, the FT, I don't know if you know any of these guys, you, uh, many of you probably do, but, but we've, we've got three incredibly competitive reporters uh, at, in the FT office. Um, so just as, as an example, I, I have to go, when we're in the physical office, I have to go to the FT office to file my expenses on the on an FT computer. And uh, sometimes when I walk in, it gets really quiet. These are all my good friends, but I can tell when they're working on something and they really, really I mean, they trust me, but they don't trust me, right? Because uh, so 
um, uh, so they compete. They, they want to compete, and it goes the other way around, uh, which has occasionally put me in an awkward position, uh, straddling both worlds. But so The second I, part I, of, that, of yeah. Tony's question, a bit more contentious, do you think that there is any anything in this idea that a Nikkei, you know, is based more on, on facts and the FT in more opinion? What, what do you think? So, uh, yes, I think, I think FT readers are paying to uh, have some analysis and some attempt to decipher what's happening. And um, uh, Nikkei does do uh, good analytical pieces, but uh, I think they like to give the new news in a very, very straight way. So uh, we've been talking about this for a few years now that when we get a translation of a Nikkei news piece, one of the things that we often say is, okay, we do need some context here. We need, uh, we need a, you know, a what it all means paragraph. Um, and uh, uh, otherwise this is only going to make sense to the people in this narrow business, right? Who are in, in so um, I, I I do think that you know at the FT it's that second nature you're going to put in that context and background and and uh, um, and even quote some critics right and you may not find that in a in a straight spot a uh, Nikkei news story. Okay, uh, I. I think that's really, really interesting, and I can see the battle you must have to bring the sort of two things to synthesize. I mean, is that what you're trying to do, to synthesize two different cultures? Yes, and I think, well, we've done a lot of, as I say, we've had uh, a number of master classes on how to do these things. Um, I mean, often they, they are the same master class that we would give at the FT, so it's not but it's just kind of a reminder of um, at this point in the story, we need to, exp we need to back up and explain this. Um, and maybe in the beginning, this was, uh, you know, maybe there was some resistance to this, but I think it's pretty, it's pretty ingrained in people's idea of what a Nikkei Asia story looks like now. Yeah, okay. I'm changing direction. I'm going to take another question. This is from our Vice President, Alison Beal. Um, building on the question of who you're writing for, who do you think the media in general should write for, for their readers or for the sake of some higher truth? Uh, do you try to write what you think your readers want to read or what you think they ought to know about? Um, I'd like both of you to attempt to answer this big question. Francesca, do you want to go first or shall I go first on that? Oh, please go first. Well, it's, it is a really good question. Um, I think, and in a way, this is, this is something that um, even in the, in the print days, we, we all wondered, right, who, <laughs> who's really reading this, right? And so you, in, a, in a way, the journalist is always going to go with uh, their, their, their feeling about what's interesting and uh, what's a good story. We have all of these ways of measuring now uh, who exactly where our readers are, how long they spend on a story. Do they just spend 30 seconds on a story? Uh, do they read the whole thing? We can measure all of that. Um, but I think essentially we are still trying to uh, uh, put out a story that we feel is important, newsworthy, and interesting. Uh, and I don't, 
the higher truth question doesn't pop into my head very often, but every now and then you really do feel it. So when we were covering Hong Kong last year, you really feel it. When you cover Myanmar, you're really feeling it. You really feel like you're doing something that's incredibly important. Um, so I, I, that, that's my take. That's a great answer. I'm going to bring in for Francesca. I'd like you to think about the same issue, Francesca, but there, there is another question that came in a little bit earlier. Um, about do, do you have a social conscience as a journalist, uh, Francesca? I mean, are you occasionally looking at articles or issues and thinking, what is the positive change in society or government or, or business that's that, that's necessary that would help Japan or, or help um, Asia? Or are you, as a journalist, obliged to be more sort of fact-based and, and neutral and, and less opinionated? Um, can you react to that Francesca? Um, I, I get this question all the time when people ask me uh, how do you come up with your stories uh, and I always say I don't come up with them they don't come from my imagination um, like I observe things I write down how I see it in my notebook and then I transfer what's in my notebook to the story um, and that's how I think that's how it should be um, there are some stories where that were have been close to me where I had to pull myself back and think, um, okay, let's try to see this uh, in a less personal light. And there was one recent example of that. Um, I wrote about how um, uh, Japan's state of emergency and the border restrictions uh, were affecting foreign students uh, who were supposed to start their April semesters in less than two weeks, which would not have given them enough time to get a visa or to quarantine uh, before they had to start going to classes. Um, and it was as a former international student um, and someone who's also had to deal with immigration issues uh, myself, I definitely felt for them. And I told them when I was interviewing them, yeah, this is a really unfair situation. I'm sorry you had to, I'm sorry you're going through this. Um, but when I, but I also had to talk to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs about that because they're the ones who are processing the visas. Um, and the person who oversees foreign nationals affairs uh, at MOFA, um, he's someone I've uh, spoken to uh, a lot in the past um, and someone who's always been earnest with me. Um, and so I tried to be very fair to him and ask, so what's going on? Like, why aren't, uh, why aren't you doing anything about the situation? What kind of complaints are you getting? And from our conversation, I understood that there wasn't anything they were going to be able to do for these students. Um, and so when I was writing my story, um, keeping all of that in mind, I just decided, okay, I'm just going to lay out the facts as I got them. This is what the students are going to. This is uh, going through. This is why it's happening, um, and this is why the government can't do anything about it. Um, and I think overall, I was quite proud of how that story turned out. Uh, when I look back on my stories, the ones that I feel most proud of aren't the ones that got the most clicks or page views. It's the ones that held up. Um, where, you know, I look back six months later and I pick out a line and I say, oh, that's still true to this day. Right. I love that answer. I think it's a great answer. Um, gonna, another question that's come in, this is from Phil Robertson, um, who runs a translation company. Um, he's quoting uh, Okumura-san, who's the editor-in-chief of Nikkei Asia, recently tweeting that he sometimes uses AI machine translation in the course of his work. And Phil's question is, is the use of machine translation now catching on in the financial news business? And if so, what safeguards are in place to prevent the publication of horrendous mistranslations? Uh, I guess we should go to you on that one, Chris. Well, it's, it is used, uh, I think it's used frequently in, in the newsroom in the sense that uh, we are, uh, uh, we are an English language uh, publication inside a very large Japanese organization. I think quickly, sometimes even 
good English speakers like Okamura-san will do a machine translation on something first just so that they can get a, a sense of something and, and, and read through it quickly. Uh, we don't use it for, uh, for our news stories, um, not even a little bit. Uh, it's, it, it's better, right? It's, it's better, but it's not, it's not, it's not close. No. Yeah, we tried it before uh, when uh, on the breaking news shift, uh, we tried doing a machine translation because I can't fully translate Japanese uh, pieces to English. Um, and there was so much nuance lost. So I don't, we didn't try it again. Um, I think like what safeguards are in place, humans, uh, when I have to read government documents, I run them through Google Translate first. Uh, and then when I see something that catches my eye, I ask my Japanese colleagues, hey, did this translate correctly? Am I misunderstanding this? And they do the same with me uh, when they're uh, like reading or transcribing uh, English interviews. Yeah, I think the days of being actually seamless in the use of machine translation, certainly in the Japanese language to English are a long, long way away. So um, I think these um, hoops you have to jump through in the production of and your daily job, you're, you're going to be stuck with those. Um, we've got a few more minutes left if people have got uh, other questions, the Q&A function uh, is there. Um, I wanted to ask you both, go back to this issue of um, Asia and being an Asian publication for Asia. I mean, is it really possible in this huge region with so many countries, so many different cultures, so many different populations, how can you create something that's relevant to somebody in Jakarta, somebody in Laos, somebody in Myanmar, and somebody uh, in Tokyo? What, what are you doing there? Well, some stories are just going to be kind of local stories, which is fine. Um, uh, I think, you know, when we write about Malaysian politics, uh, we get a re we get really huge, pr predictably, we get really huge interest uh, from Malaysia. The, the Mal our, our Malaysian audience is really, um, uh, it, it, they're vigorous and they, they you know, they, uh, they can be avid readers of our stuff. Uh, so that's good. Uh, we we can we're giving M Malaysian readers something that they want. So I think writing some local stuff is is good. Um, some the the big stories take care of themselves. Uh, the Myanmar story is we're uh, uh, we're getting a lot of readership around the world on that story. Mm -hmm. U.S.-China trade stories uh, a lot of uh, global readership, um, but um, uh, pardon me. Um, so, uh, so yes, we. I, I think on on the big stories, these things uh, cross borders. Um, is there really? And I guess you you mentioned earlier the air pollution story. That that is an Asia wide story and so we did take reporting from lots of places and stitch that together and i never really i knew for instance i knew that crop burning was uh, a big issue in indonesia and india but i didn't realize the extent to which it's it's a, a huge problem for air quality uh, across southeast asia and other places so using we can use our big network to find links uh, sometimes links that you didn't know existed between places. Okay. Francesca, do you have a comment on, you're from the Philippines, based in Tokyo. How do you build Asia? Right there. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, I, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not too difficult because it's, everyone's so interested in it. Even my, my friends in, uh, in DC and New York, they... Uh, they read Nikkei Asia because they want to know what's going on in this very important region. Um, just last week, I uh, had a friend uh, who's a lawyer in DC uh, who said to me, why isn't anyone, 
linking the semiconductor supply shortage to the drought in Taiwan. Um, and it felt really good that I could send him the archive of our Taipei reporters uh, past stories uh, over the last few months because they've been really on this. Um, and then later in the day, I ran a story about um, uh, Prime Minister Suga's meeting with President Biden and uh, the same friend came back to me and said, I can't believe I was ranting about this while you were literally writing a story about it. And so I don't think it's, a, it's we don't have to stretch ourselves to make Asia relevant to, to the US or to Europe. Um, regionally, uh, there have been some stories that, you know, I was writing about something hyper local in Japan. Like um, there was this, uh, small supplier to Airbus and Boeing. They supply the little turbine blades uh, that goes into the engines of the of the planes. Um, and they were one of the recipients of the China exit subsidy from METI. Um, and I went over to their factory, wrote a story about them, why they, what they were going to use the subsidy for. Um, and I think that story did really well in Singapore of uh, all places. Uh, and so it's, we can never really predict, but it's always surprising when we look at our metrics. Interesting. Um, I'm going to, well, we're coming towards the end, but so maybe a final question. What remains to be done, Chris? Where do you see this going in the next two or three years? What, what you know, What's the development uh, trajectory? Right. So we, we have a lot of goals. I think uh, we would really like to expand in, into some other areas. Um, we find that when we write about uh, uh, places like, if, if, if we write a story about the Bangladesh economy, for instance, or if we, uh, um, there's, there's a huge readership for that. So at a time when a lot of news organizations are uh, reducing the number of their bureaus, we'd like, to, uh, we'd like to expand, particularly in places, people call them frontier Asia or places like that. Um, we, uh, Nikkei uh, is investing a lot into data journalism uh, and uh, we want to make more sophisticated interactive graphics. And we finally, I would say that we want to move uh, deeper into investigations. I think we're doing well on news and, uh, and uh, you know, longer analytical pieces, but I think over the next three to five years, we'd really like to uh, uh, start breaking some really big investigative stories. And on the commercial side, you've got a marketing trajectory. Uh, yes. So, uh, well, we have a we have a, a pretty aggressive and very aggressive annual uh, subscription targets, which we've managed to hit in the last few years, um, and. Um, I apologize. Uh, uh, and those are not going to stop, right? Uh, we, we, we have to keep hitting these things for the next few years uh, and, and make this into a viable commercial product. So a commercially viable uh, product. We've been in startup mode. Nikkei invests for the long term, but uh, eventually it does need to, uh, it needs to be able to stand on its own. So, yeah. Okay, I think that's a great place to finish. I mean, I said at the beginning, I'm very impressed with the work that's been done. Um, I think the Nikkei stewardship of the FT itself is uh, a good story and a positive story reflects well on the Nikkei, but the efforts that the Nikkei and the FT have made to develop this uh, franchise in the Nikkei Asia, um, really, really interesting. I'd like to thank you both so much for your contributions today. Uh, a lot of unfair questions to you um, on the spot a bit. Uh, but thank you so much for your insights and, and the stories from uh, how you're facing the challenges that you face uh, to develop uh, such a good uh, product. So thanks very much. I hope everybody has enjoyed today's uh, publication. I'm sure the Nikkei Asia will be delighted to take more subscriptions. Um, and uh, perhaps we could uh, help you uh, on that and, and have a a link to a subscription uh, page if that would be uh, helpful. Um, but uh, thank you. And uh, we're going to leave today's event there. And I hope to see everybody soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.